Here in Naples, as in other cities all over the globe, top international soccer teams fought like gladiators to qualify for the greatest event in world football, the World Cup of 1966. In this year, and for the first time in the Cup's short, hectic history, the final rounds came to be played in Britain, in the islands where the game, as we now know it, was born more than a century ago. Soccer ranges from stadium to backyard and must surely be Britain's most successful export. It's played in more than 120 countries throughout the world. Like everything else, British football has had its ups and downs. But it's a fact that today, when spectator sports in Britain have been hit by the telly and the family car, more than half a million people crowd in to watch the big league games pretty well every Saturday. More than any other, it's the national game of these islands. To the big clubs in particular, the going is still good, and there's not much wrong with football at the top. The gate money goes up, even if the attendances fall slightly, for the spectators are prepared to pay more to get a comfortable seat. And apart from the supporters of the matches, there are millions to whom the Saturday afternoon football results are part of a particularly British way of life. Blackpool 1, Chelsea 2. So the World Cup was always assured of a right royal welcome. The solid gold cup was designed by a Frenchman in 1930. It's insured for nearly 3,000 pounds. World Cup Willy quickly became the symbol of British football followers' hopes that England could give the cup a new home. As the matches drew nearer, the excitement mounted, expressing itself in scores of different ways, including a great outbreak of souvenir making. After England had been chosen as the host country for the 1966 series, the World Cup organization established headquarters at the White City, scene of one of the London matches. Months before the games were due to start, checks were coming in from all over the world. With six months to go, more than 600,000 pounds have been sent in for tickets. Altogether, the matches could accommodate nearly two and a half million people, paying over one and a half million pounds for the privilege. And a world television link-up was fixed to pipe the games to every continent. Only one venue could possibly be chosen for the World Cup final, Wembley. For more than 40 years, the showcase of English football. Here, soccer history has often been made. It was here that England's record of invincibility at home fell before Pushkas and his Hungarians, and here in the last year or two that a revival has been seen in England's form. A small fortune has been spent in recent years putting Wembley completely under cover. It's easily one of the best grounds in the world, fit for the greatest cup final of them all. It needs to be first class. It has to stand comparison with the great grounds where football is now played abroad. Grounds like Naples, which still shows the scars where a crowd rioted in 1963. It's a long, long trail in every sense, from Naples, for example, to Middlesbrough on Teesside, one of the eight English grounds selected for the 1966 World Cup series. Between them, the Football Association and the government put up more than half a million pounds in loans and grants to the chosen clubs to be spent on ground improvements for the vital matches. Big building schemes were pushed forward at Middlesbrough and Aston Villa. New stands were built earlier at Manchester United and Sheffield Wednesday, all designed to give the best possible accommodation. Big improvements were made at Everton. In this way, the World Cup and the 50,000 foreign visitors following in its wake would leave some lasting benefit behind for English football, particularly English football in the provinces. If one day the Scottish Football Association are World Cup hosts, similar improvements might then be put in hand for grounds north of the border. One man anxious to help the provinces was Dennis Howell, the government minister with special responsibility for sport. He should know. He's on the list of active soccer referees. And he believed that the game needed most help outside London. Perhaps he was thinking mainly of the less glamorous clubs who get less than their share of the headlines, for many of them certainly need help. Some find the going very tough indeed, but they're still vital to the game. The players, 
underpaid not so many years ago, are now in show business and expect and get substantial salaries for their short playing lines. Their cost makes it tough for the more modest clubs, some of which can only keep going from handouts from keen local supporters. One man who isn't worried about the state of football is Alf Ramsey, manager of the England team. He's both a tactician and an optimist. England had never won the World Cup, had never been in its final, but Ramsey always believed that it could be done. Bobby Moore and Bobby Charlton are but two of his star-laden training squad, key men. But every player is a key man when it comes to the World Cup. It was said that Ramsey gets the best from his stars when he has them abroad on foreign tours. In home matches, he only has them together for a day or two. So a vital program of international games was arranged before the start of the cup matches. It was designed to give the manager his chance to knit together a team of world class. And world class it has to be. For in little more than a hundred years, football has erupted like Vesuvius. A long way from the placid village greens of England, it's now the national game of countries around the Mediterranean and in Latin America. It's crossed the frontiers of Europe to Russia and beyond. More than any other, it's the global game, played barefooted on tropical Pacific islands and fur-clad near the poles. More than 70 countries competed for places to get into the last 16 for the World Cup. To the fervent, frenzied supporters, the matches had everything. Football, patriotism, excitement, and the march of the gladiators. These indeed were the Roman games of the modern world, played maybe from Ecuador to Glasgow. And as the preliminary games went on, so the excitement rose, along with the thermometer of national fervor. As host country, England was given an automatic pass into the final tournament. The other British teams had to try to fight their way through the preliminary rounds, and they failed. Scotland came near, but finally went down to Italy, amid the wild excitement of the Naples Stadium, with the thunder flashes cracking and exploding on the outfield, and the seat cushions fluttering in the air like confetti. How many teams could have qualified against this fantastic background of jubilant frenzy as the Italians cheered their team on into the last 16? A good show in the World Cup is a matter of national importance. Winning it, a national triumph. To the players, victory means greater fame and greater bonuses. Ever more starry-eyed hero worship from the seething crowds. A few years ago, the England team wasn't rated with an outside chance. But Alf Ramsey never agreed. And it was a tribute to him that, as the World Cup series drew near, so his team became favourites with the holders Brazil.